Hey everybody, it's Michael with Bay Area Hiking Guides. Give me that information, give me that knowledge to go out there and hike with confidence. And in this video, we're going to be talking about some really unique edible plants we have here in the Bay Area. And I got Tyler waiting for us to uh, inform you guys there's some really awesome stuff. You've got to check this video out. Alright, stay tuned. Okay guys, so welcome back. Um, I got Tyler out there waiting for us in uh, Walnut Creek down there by the city. A nice little walk they got there that they built, but um, he's going to talk about some really unique edible plants we have here in the Bay Area. Um, as well as a rose and some cool awesome history about this rose. I always find it really fascinating, especially when I start doing the editing for these videos. Uh, listening to what Tyler has to say and be like, whoa, man, he's just so impactful, full of knowledge. You guys are really in for a real nice treat. Um, also, it is always important, as a disclaimer, to not go around eating just anything willy-nilly. Some of these plants, you know, uh, might look like something else, and that can be a real serious issue depending on what you eat. So always, always have a professional out there with you to inform you and to educate you on what these plants are and have a very 100% guarantee that you know that is the plant that you're about to eat. Just don't go around eating anything. Okay guys, Tyler, take it away, buddy. Okay, so now we are looking at one of my favorite trailside plants, the California elderberry. And this is the elderberry that we find here in the hotter, drier parts of Contra Costa County and other places as well. There's another one, which I'll talk about in a second, but this one is really wonderful from an edible plant point of view. So first of all, what we've been seeing for the last month, you know, through the month of May, is the beautiful flowers. So it makes these big clusters of really kind of pale yellow, or you might call it cream colored, big clusters of flowers. Very beautiful, covers the whole plant. This is a large shrub in most cases. And again, it has that wonderful shape where you've got a flat cluster of flowers and the butterflies will come and work all those flowers. But now they're beginning to turn into berries. They're beginning to turn into fruit. So this one is an example of the green fruit. The flower petals have fallen off and behind each little baby flower was the ovary that had the seeds in it and it is now swelling up to produce this fruit. But if you wait a little longer, you will get this. If you can see these here, how they're turning kind of a blue purple color Eventually, the whole bush here will be covered with these purpley blue berries. So that's where the name comes from, elder berries. And when they are completely purple and soft, then they're ripe. Now, people have done a lot of different things with elderberry over the years. There are some medicinal uses of the flowers. There's a kind of an interesting edible thing that I've heard people do with flowers where you dip the flower cluster in a kind of a batter and then deep fry it. So you're literally making elder flower fritters. I've never tried that, but, uh, and, and actually I've heard of people making wine from the flowers as well, elder flower wine. But what I'm really interested in is the fact that this fruit, these wonderful purple berries, are just a delicious fruit for making syrup or jam from. Now, I will say, if you just pop a couple of these berries off and try chewing them up on the trail, A, they're a little bit tart, and B, each one has a seed inside. So it's kind of, you know, you're chewing a lot. The thing is, if you take a bunch of clusters of these ripe berries home and mash them up till you get the juice, that tartness is actually an advantage, right? You don't want bland fruit. You want a nice flavor with a little bit of acidity to give it some character, right? Think of the difference between a really sweet apple, like a Fuji apple, versus a one that's got some tartness to it, like a John of Gold or a Gala or uh, my favorite, a pink lady. Just that little bit of tartness is actually a good thing. You don't want it to be sour like a lemon. So to my view, the elderberries are perfectly balanced. Flavorful, sweet, and still tart. And that makes a great jam or syrup. So you squeeze those berries up till you get the juice. And if you want jam, you just keep cooking and cooking and cooking until it's thick. If you want syrup, you're pretty much done after you maybe add some additional sugar for sweetness. So elderberry is a wonderful plant 
and Sambucus is the genus name. <clears throat> and you will find beautiful purple berries right around this time of year. Now, one last thing to say is that this is another great example of knowing your native plants before you start eating them or trying to use them medicinally. Because as I mentioned, there's another version of this elderberry. It grows more in the cool, shadier parts of our region, so like Berkeley Hills. Those berries, when they turn ripe, are red, and those berries are not good for you at all. Now, they're not gonna kill you in one second if you eat a single berry, but you would not feel very good if you ate any quantity of those red elderberries. So you need to understand the difference between our native one out here in Contra Costa that turns purple and the coastal one that has the red berries. Again, spend some time with somebody who knows what they're talking about, look at the books, look at the videos, learn your plants. Oh, actually one last cool thing, the Native Americans would prune this plant by breaking the branches off, which caused the plant to grow a stem very long and straight in response to that pruning. And they would let it get nice and thick and it has a lot of soft pith inside that stem. So they would hollow out the pith and now you have a, a hollow tube. And then they would cut the tube halfway around so that uh, one half of the tube could kind of move freely against the other half like that. And it was what they call the, what we call, I don't know the native name for it, they call it a clapper stick. And that was a rhythm instrument made from the elderberry stems that the native groups in this area use, far as I understand, instead of a skin drum. I was taught that the uh, natives in this area didn't use the skin drums like elsewhere in the country. So just another cool use for elderberry. But that is our beautiful elderberry. Okay, so this plant is really wonderful because you may have been walking past it on your hikes all the time and seeing it and not really realizing what you're looking at. Because we have, as many areas of the world do, a wild or totally native rose. That's right, this is just a good old rose. But you're thinking, that doesn't look anything like the roses in my garden. True, it's not. This original wild rose was bred and bred and bred over and over, over a period of hundreds if not thousands of years by human gardeners until they created a flower with multiple petals, dense, dense petals, all clustered together in one bloom. And that is what we plant in our gardens today, and obviously a much bigger flower as well. But it all started with this native rose, this original rose, which is a single petal flower, just one layer of petals spread out. And if you look carefully, you can see some of the structures and the shapes of the flower itself are the same as your garden rose. It's just a simpler flower. And we usually find it kind of growing in a shrubby form, so it's going to be a pretty big, it's not going to be a little plant, it's going to be a fairly big shrub. This one here is beautiful. And at this time of year is a great time to notice the transition. So we've had all these wonderful pink flowers covering it for the last month or two. Those are now falling off, and we're beginning to see the little structure beneath the flower, just like we were talking about with the elderberry. That's the ovary that contains the seeds. Well, it begins to swell up. At the moment, they're green. You do have to be careful, by the way, these have just the same kind of thorns that the garden roses do. But those rose hips, which they're called, are going to turn red. So we're gonna let them sit there for a while until they turn a nice bright red. And then they are really wonderful as a nutritional addition to your beverages, or you can make syrup or jam, again, or jelly, I should say, from them. So the thing about rose hips is they contain a lot of vitamin C. In fact, you may have seen some natural vitamins or other supplements that have a, on the label with rose hips added, right? Because they're super packed with vitamin C. So what I like to do is take those rose hips when they're nice and red and crush them up a little bit and simmer them in water. So I'm basically making a rose hip tea. And then you can either take that and put it into your other iced tea that you've made, let's say just regular black iced tea or an herbal iced tea, and it gives it a nice little tartness and it also fills it with vitamin C nutrition, which is so healthy for us. And the thing that you should know is that vitamin C is an acid. You may have seen the scientific name ascorbic acid. Well, acids are a little sour, right? Like citric acid, that's what lemon juice has. So that ascorbic acid gives a little tartness to your iced tea which is delicious, right? You can sweeten it as well, so you get a sweet tart balance. 
So it's very simple, very delicious to add some rose hips to your beverages. You could also take that tea that you made from the rose hips, add some sugar, and cook it till it's syrupy. Or you can add pectin and actually make rose hip jelly, which is a beautiful pink color and tastes very nice. So those are all some great uses of our native rose. And of course, it's a favorite of bees, which come to pollinate it. And it's a beautiful trailside treat to find a native rose. I will say, the petals don't have that strong fragrance that our garden roses do. So if you were going to try to make a potpourri, or even, uh, you know, rose petal, rose flower water, or something like that, from the native rose, don't bother. There's really not enough fragrance there in the flower itself, but it's lovely to look at. And then you wait for those rose hips to develop and you get something great. I do want to say one little thing in general about all these plants where we're talking about collecting parts of the plants, right? Cutting off the elderberries, picking the rose hips. If you are in a place where you can tell that there's an abundance of this particular plant and you are very respectful and thoughtful about the amount that you're taking, then I would say it's all right in most cases. Now, if you're in a state park, I do have to say, the official rule is you can't take a single thing from a state park. So Mount Diablo, forget it. But if you're in a regional park or other open space and you can see that this plant is thriving, it has a lot of neighbors of the same variety and they're all thriving, then I think it's appropriate to take some of that plant for your own use in most cases. I'm not talking about digging it out of the ground, of course. But really notice what you're doing. And if you come across one little example of a plant that's just barely struggling to keep up and it only has a few berries on it, the respectful thing to do is to leave that. You really need to be careful. And there are actually whole books on the whole concept of using and harvesting natural plants in an ecologically balanced way. So do a little research on that before you just go start cutting things off and taking them off of the plant. Anyway, our California beautiful native rose. I love it. All right, guys, have a wonderful day. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. We all appreciate it. Me, Tyler, Beth, have a great day. Thank you.